Counting backwards from five, four, three, two, and... <laughs> If it's Tuesday, it is your favorite day of the week, and it's your favorite day. Whoa, my goodness, what just happened? I'm not sure that was supposed to happen, but uh, yeah, welcome to Comic Book School Live. I don't know, can you get, are, are you seeing that? Hold on, I, are you seeing this? That is kind of crazy stuff. I'm going to say that that is a technical issue. Let's see if we can fix this. <laughs> and then we oh, cannot fix this. Like, uh, hit the, hit the right button. I'm not sure what the button is but here, how about we do this all right so we you fix it like that hopefully hopefully that does not pretend how this show will go mike i'm gonna blame uh my little nap it is now 8 p.m and i had a little nap and i think i'm gonna be glenn wait until the rest of the show and we guarantee you you will feel sick to your stomach but thanks for coming glenn we're always happy to see you glenn is always the go-to guy that we know that if it's just you and me, Mike, it'll be you, me, and Glenn. Glenn will be here. Glenn will always be here. So I'm wearing my eyeglasses, Mike, and I might look a little tired. I, I dampened my hair to get the bed head out. I've worked a full day. I got home and I was like, just a 10 minute nap. And then I was like, ah, oh, you know what? 10 minutes more of snooze. 45 minutes later, I'm like, I got to get up. Oh, you should have, you should have just stayed sleeping. You yeah, should have taken the computer into your bed and done it on your laptop in bed. You know what? There's a good possibility that that might have happened with one more snooze. So he was, oh, I'm chewing it down, man. Man, chicken doesn't taste good the second time. Oh, man, Gatilla's going there already. We just got started. And he's already sick. Let's just see what happens. Will, will this work? Let's just see what happens. Uh-oh. Huh. Now it's not working. Oh. <laughs> I hope our slides work. All right, so here, here's what we're going to do, Mike. We're, what we're going to do is we tonight are going to be doing a remembrance of a comic book artist named M.D. Bright. And this was triggered from a mutual friend of ours and somebody who's joined us for the show a few times um, and how he raised awareness of the passing of this legendary comic book artist that was... Uh, unfortunately, there was a lot of news going on during uh, that week. And hold on. Thank you so much for doing this. Hey, we haven't done it yet. So don't thank us until we're done. You may not thank us in the end. You might go, I wish you hadn't done this. Because I don't know if I'm even going to be able to get the graphics to work. But maybe we will be able to get it to work. But anyway, a good friend of the show and a good friend of ours uh, was calling out um, M.D. Bright. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that M.D. Bright had passed. And I remembered him uh, from Quantum and Woody and, yep. and some other comic books. And then I started following his Twitter feed and I just thought, wow, wow, we I really did not know much about this artist. Mike, we were working at Wizard in the 90s at the time. We prided ourselves on knowing many of the creators uh, if not personally, but just, you know, somehow by name. Hold on. He says, when sharing your stream, minimize live stream. It's causing a recursion session. Oh, what? 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 Minimize the screen, the stream. Minimize the screen. No, th this was Shakespearean. Minimize thy screen. <laughs> thy stream. <laughs> the live stream. Oh, the live stream. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'll have to do that. You know what? Let's just bring our guest in because I think probably that's probably the most important thing that we can do. Please welcome our friend, Joe, Joseph P. Illard. Joe, welcome to the show. Thanks for waiting patiently backstage as I tried to figure out the technology. 
Now you're welcome. Thank you for having me and thank you for um, presenting this opportunity for this celebration of Mark's life. Yeah, Joe, I think um, what caught my eye, and I'm going to pull up your Twitter stream if you don't mind. Um, what caught my eye was that, you know, th there was a lot of news. I'm not going to go into the news because I just don't think it, it I think it'll just um, be uh, not what we want to talk about. Joe, you had marked uh, a personal friend of yours. <coughs> Um, and I started seeing photos and you were talking about how, uh, MD Bright had passed, uh, and you knew him through, I believe the, uh, milestone days. And I did not see all that much, uh, out there, uh, from the fan press, which we include ourselves in the fan press. And I just thought, well, you know what? I don't know a lot about MD Bright but you do. And I thought maybe you can lead us through a uh, celebration and some contextualization of um, who uh, MD Bright was both to you personally as a friend and as a comic book professional. All right. I mean, there's so much to the man and his career that this episode will by no means encapsulate it, but you know, we'll give it our best shot for me personally as a comic book reader, and I've been reading comic books since I was a kid, I'm confident my first exposure to Mark's work was Power Man and Iron Fist, right? And at the time, he was working with writer Christopher Priest, who at that time went by his name of James C. Owsley. And that would be the beginning of this long-standing partnership, this creative partnership and developing friendship between those two men. And then I remember Mark's work for the Falcon series, which Paul Smith started, but then after issue one, he left because Marvel gave him a shot at Uncanny X-Men. And so Mark took over and did Falcons two, three, and four. So he really did the majority of that series. And I think before I got to Milestone, the work that he did that made the biggest impression on me was Green Lantern Emerald Dawn. And I believe that was the first Green Lantern miniseries that did an in-depth story of how Hal Jordan became Green Lantern. And I remember the first issue was the most intelligent exploration that I had ever read about the understanding of how the Green Lantern rings work and how it relates to the human capacity for fear. And above and beyond Priest's amazing script was Mark's art. And, you know, it's interesting in our industry, and we can talk about this more later, a number of artists that are elevated in media are ones with styles that are deemed exciting or that are aesthetically similar to things in pop culture that are exciting. And then what happens is between in those chasms are lost a lot of truly talented artists who know the craft. And it's not about the artwork being exciting or spectacular or dazzling, if we want to use those kinds of adjectives, but it's about high quality art. It's about the understanding of the craft, the understanding of storytelling. And that's where Mark always excelled. So Green Lantern Emerald Dawn for me, the entire series, and especially issues one and six were some of my favorite comics at the time. So when I got to Milestone in 1993, I started in May of 1993. And by that time, I believe that Icon was the second series that came out. I could be wrong. Hardware came out February of 1993. So Icon number one came out either in March or April of that year. So by the time I started interning in May, Icon was already in publication. Well, let me pull back because Icon was definitely in publication. 
And I think it came out in March and I'll tell you why. Um, Mark Bright is actually the artist that changed my life. He changed the direction of my life. And I say that because I've told this origin story a number of times, but I'll tell it again because it speaks to this. I was what we call in between jobs. So I was unemployed and I couldn't even afford to take the bus to get to some place that was a walk over 15 minutes. So I remember I had to take this 30 minute walk to a newsstand here in Brooklyn, which at the time was on the corner of Utica Avenue and Church Avenue and Brooklynites know what corner I'm talking about. And there was a newsstand there and had the spinner rack. And there were a bunch of comic books in there, the same ones you see all the time, Captain America, Justice League, The Avengers, Superman. But I saw the cover for Icon number two and it had Icon and Rocket. So one superhero who was dressed in a uniform that had the colors of the um, African flag and then his sidekick Rocket, young woman dressed in blue and red, two of the three primary colors and they were fighting this whole group of riot cops. I never saw a comic book cover reflect a social truth back at me like that. Because we're talking about Brooklyn in the 90s, there was a lot of racial tension. Um, music had become more political in the later 80s hip hop music. I really got plugged into public enemy at that time due to some friends that I knew from high school and due to going to college at school of visual arts and meeting like the militant black clique who somewhat forcibly helped me start to engage my blackness as a human being. And so icon number two, that cover had a profound effect on me. And a friend of mine named Jason Scott Jones was interning at Milestone. He told me about Milestone and I said, well, I didn't want to work at a company for free because in those days, internships were, were not paying. But I saw that comic and I truly had a moment where I knew that, I knew that the people making that comic book were going to change the world, just as a fact. And I was like, I don't want to be on this side. I want to I want to be with them changing the world. I want to be with the people who are making icon. And so I applied for an internship, which I blew to hell because I had chips on both my shoulders and Jason stuck up for me and they decided to give me a shot. And so I started interning at Milestone in May of 93. And I believe I met Mark, I would say probably in August for the first time because when Milestone first opened, it was um, at this building in Chelsea in Manhattan, and it had one office space. But within that first year, they expanded to a second office space right next to the first one. Um, and so I think at that time, icon number five may have been the issue that was out. And icon and rocket were meeting the blood syndicate and i used to copy all these amazing artist pages full size and i would take them home and i would have these copies of their pencils and out of all the artists mark was the artist that i copied the most so when i finally met him you know of course i'm geeking out and i'm trying to maintain my professionalism but i mean that was the guy all right, and so here's we're gonna, wait, here's what we're going to do. We, we, we have art to show Joe. Yeah. And I want to do something real quick. First, before we go any further, I want to okay. set up who you are so that people understand the context to you as a working comic book pro. Okay. So first things first, um, for those of you who are joining, by the way, someone, um, Someone named Tori uh, validated you're correct. It was the second milestone release. Um, I guess you were talking about Icon. So somebody named right. Icon World goes by Tori. Yes. Uh, and, and then, Thank you, Tori. And then Comics Are Dope says, man, I envy that job, LOL. Yeah, I envy it too. I kind of wish that I had gone on staff working at a comic publisher too. Don't you, Mike, sometimes? I wish I did, yeah. There's a lot of things I wish I did. And some <laughs> yeah. of the, some of the, 
<laughs> Some of them are more repeatable one. here. So, uh, Mark uh, D. Bright, M.D. Bright, I guess you guys sometimes called him Mark, sometimes called him Doc because of the M.D., uh, passed away. There's an article on CBR that has a has a very nice remembrance of him. Uh, some of the background that you shared is more personal than than what we saw. You know, they they're they're more factual. Um, this was the tweet that got me interested. So for those of you who are joining a little bit late, and my dad who is watching right now, everybody, everybody just say hi to my dad, please, because my dad is watching. Let's hold on. Let's get a little round of applause for my father. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in. Also uh, tunes in, but so does my dad. So um, real quick, Joe, uh, just for some context, uh, you are a successful working writer, editor, publishing consultant. Um, you're out of New York. Just make sure we capture who you are. Uh, you have also worked at many publishers, including DC, Milestone, uh, Heavy Metal, so give us the Joe Illage uh, uh, 30,000 foot. Wow. Well, it's not really about me, so I'll keep it brief. You know, right now I am a freelance editor. I have private clients and I'm really doing a lot of writing. Something that I'm working on that I'm very proud of is the middle grade uh, graphic novel adaptation of the Harriet Tubman novel that was written by Ann Petrie. And the latest edition has a cover by one of the most amazing illustrators of our time, Kadir Nelson. So I've learned so much about Harriet Tubman that I'm really humbled to have the opportunity to do this. I'm writing a variety of things that are going to be announced this year. But, you know, the most pertinent thing is my career started at Milestone in 1993. Milestone showed me what my purpose in life was because being a black comic book geek child of the seventies and teenager of the eighties basically meant that I was a social pariah. We're talking decades before the MCU and everyone knew the name Thanos. <laughs> and I wasn't sure I went to high school of art and design and I went to the school of visual arts here in New York. And so I have an understanding of art, which has made me, I'm going to say, a better editor than most. But being an artist, that was not my fate. And I didn't know what the direction of my life was. And when I saw Milestone, and it showed that my admiration and love of comics had a business application, you know, that was stage one. But the real eye-opening purpose was that comics was inadequate and this world was inadequate and everybody from every ethnicity walk of life um sexual lifestyle deserve to have a voice and a place in comics just as they deserve to have a voice and place in the world so milestone was where i started working in comics and where that mission began and that mission continues to this day, the elevation of voices and to the point of the post, the tweet that you saw, I felt that for someone of Mark's legendary impact for him to be so marginalized in terms of media obituaries and commentary, that was something that I considered unacceptable. So I use social media to basically do a history lesson for people about Mark Bright, not just that he was an artist, but that he was an artist at seminal points in comic book and pop culture history that are now being manifested today by mega corporations, well, you know, and here's the thing. I think what 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 I found interesting, and we'll we'll tour you guys through some of his art was. Apparently, he was not a guy who sought out publicity. Mike, we were we were at Wizard at the time when we were covering Milestone. We were covering those Green Lantern stories, the Wolverine stories. I never, never 
covered him in anything. I, I I can't remember having ever written anything about him. Do you, Mike? I mean, we yeah. we covered Quantum and Woody, but yeah. Priest was Christopher Priest was the guy who was out front. Yeah, right, yeah. right. I remember definitely Quantum and Woody, but I don't remember any stories being uh, written about uh, MD Bright. MD Bright. Here, yeah. Mike, you, you read the next. Read the next uh, comment, Mike. Uh, Joe has to be the most humble person to come out of Milestone next to Denny's. Joe and Chris Williams have a series called The Winterfields, a series based in the 30s and 40s. So, Joe, we will cover a little bit more of some of your work, but uh, it seems that uh, Tron World, Tori, knows you personally. But what we're going to do is we're going to take a quick tour. And since we're already 20 minutes into the show, Joe, we, we, we're going to just... Uh, Headline, some of what people are looking at. I picked some things at random. You don't know what's coming up next. It could be a picture from MD Bright. It could be a picture of Mike stepping out of the shower. <laughs> you always know what, what's coming next. So so uh, noted. So noted. So this was you, Joe. Uh, Quantum and Woody, this is, uh, this is the place where I discovered the name MD Bright. I personally thought this is one of the funniest yeah. comics that I'd ever read. And what made it work, I think, was... They played the art straight. That is, they used a real superhero artist to draw it like real superheroes. And it wasn't like, you know, like you read Hate by Peter Bagg or something by R. Crumb that you know is intended to be goofy. This worked, I thought, because of that. Before you comment, Joe, Mike, do you remember this? We we read this together, I think. Maybe yeah, I loved it. It was, it was hilarious. These Because he was just, it was just a goofball. Woody was just, you know just a goofball kind of guy. And he was so much fun to uh, to read and watch. These guys were great. Joe, Joe, ground us, Quantum and Woody. What are your memories of Quantum and Woody and MD Bright and, Cre and Priest? So, you know, Quantum and Woody, I remember buying it as the issues were coming out, starting with issue one. Quantum and Woody was part of the iteration of Valiant that at that time was owned by Acclaim, mm. which was spearheaded by Fabian Nicieza. And Quantum and Woody was this amazing outlier gem, um, in part because of its humor and because it was very metatextual in referring to itself and making fun of the superhero genre while being part of the superhero genre. And part of the reason why Mark was really the perfect artist for it above and beyond his relationship with Priest is because Mark could draw anything mm. and he made it look natural. And because this was a metatextual, satirical, superhero genre series, it had to look like real life. But, you know, it's interesting. We're in a time of art now where backgrounds aren't a given. And the absence of backgrounds is absolutely acceptable in mainstream comic book art. But people like Mark came from a generation where you had to be able to draw everything. Everything. You had to be able to draw costumes, clothes. You know, one of the things that I always look for as an editor is, okay, you can draw Superman fighting the parasite, but can you draw Clark Kent having a conversation with Lois Lane and can you make that look just as, if not more interesting? There are few people that can really do that. Jose Luis Garcia Lopez being on the Mount Rushmore of human beings that can do that. But Mark was there too. Mark yeah. could draw anything. And so he was perfect for Quantum and Woody. Quantum and Woody ran, I believe, three years. They ended up coming back in a new uh, miniseries in the third iteration of Valiant that I think launched in 2011 or 2012. And funny enough, there was a character called the goat quantum and Woody had a goat and the goat became the most popular character of the series. And the goat got a one shot and the goat got profiled more. So that also spoke to kind of like the absurdity of things and they ran with it. But you know what, but Mark drew a goat. He drew it. He well, drew a man. goat with a, with a, with a mask and a cape. <laughs> it worked. Now, to your point of, of drawing, um, you know, backgrounds, I mean, if you just, you're an artist, you know, he's got three planes, he's got an extreme foreground, 
He's got the heroes in the Mac mid ground. He's got the buildings in the background and he's even got a really deep fading point perspective. I mean, and it's all there in the pencils, right? And, and I, by the way, I pulled this off of uh, MD Bright's website. You can find many of these images and uh, pre-colored sketches there on the website. Um, incredible perspective on this, right guys? 100%, I mean, you know, when you talk about art, you talk about one point perspective, two point perspective, three point perspective. We know that Mark knew all of those. We also know that Mark understood lighting, right? Um, we obviously know he understood depth. He understood storytelling. Um, he knew how to lead the eye. The man knew the principles and he excelled at them. And, you know, to your point about the awareness of Mark, I mean, we have to remember that social media is a recent invention. And until then, it was basically artists would be seen getting together at conventions. But before that, artists were living the life that most people learned to live because of the COVID-19 pandemic, which is they were home all the time and they were doing the work, right? There's a reason why Jack Kirby went one way and Stan Lee went another because the first person was the guy at the table, seven days a week, smoking, doing the work. The second guy was a genius and he was the P.T. Barnum of the comic book industry. But it's these artists who were doing the work and for them, maybe psychologically or maybe just in terms of life priority or even the practicality of time. They weren't out there promoting themselves. That's not what they did. They were doing the work. It's now with social media and a variety of other factors that now artists have to be their own marketing and PR mechanisms. But, you know, back in the 90s, well, a lot of artists were not about that. Yeah, well, it was all print medium at that point, right? And, and you know, there was a couple of fan publications. Um, apparently, I missed this one somewhere along the way. You, you may have uh, quoted Dwayne. I'm guessing Dwayne McDuffie. You, maybe something when you commented on the art or something. I, I might have. If I did so, it wasn't intentionally. But I'm, I'm honored that Dwayne and I were aligned in our thinking in almost anything. Because, of course, Dwayne is one of the most intelligent human beings that the North American comic book industry was ever blessed with, one of the most insightful and humane writers, and the work that he and Mark did on Icon spoke to that humanity and spoke right. to that optimism for a better world. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take you through a few more because we got some of these images, and you're talking about things, and I want to be able to do show and tell with you. So we got Quantum and Woody. Uh, there was this Emerald Dawn. I thought this was a tremendous series. Mike, have you, you read this too, right? I'm sure I read it. It's, it's been so many years. I don't remember much of it. But yeah, I, I mean, would encourage you to reread it because yeah, it's yeah. got a lot of heart and, I and it's it a good story. Up, right? Yeah, I think it, I think it, I think it's one of those uh, that holds up. That's, that's when Owsley, that was when Christopher Priest was going by James Owsley. He was a, uh, an editor, and then we met him. I met him personally when they were kicking off the uh, Valiant Universe, the Fabian verse. Um, right. Apparently, uh, Bright was a uh, sought-after uh, cover artist. Joe uh, mm -hmm. so I went into the fandom uh, websites, which, by the way, if you don't use the fandom um, websites, uh, they're great resources. Um, yeah, one of the best Green Lantern series ever. Agreed. Emerald Dawn uh, broke new ground in the way stories were told. Priest did tell stories in a in a different way. He brought a different type of aesthetic. He brought almost like a like a television aesthetic to it. The way he broke uh, the story up. Um, amazing things he does with perspective and size. Um, you know, just look at those covers. Look at those you covers. don't get a Batman cover like that anymore, where you see so much of the environment. That's a hard cover to do, right? That that's that's right. That, that takes a lot of time and thinking, and I think this is also very thoughtful. the The way he knew the logo would trap over here, Valor versus Supergirl, mm -hmm. 
way he he lays this out and shows the risk. You, you, these are two covers that you judge the comic book by the cover. You you want to open the cop the comic. One hundred percent. They're they're story covers, and that Batman cover, that's a point of view cover. You almost feel like you're right above Robin, and you can see all the way down to the street. No AI here, guys. <laughs> that's a fact. That's a no fact. AI here. All right. Where are we here? Uh, I did not know he did this Spider-Man Wolverine. That was a surprise to me. And I also one hundred percent. Yes, he did. Uh, you see the image on the right here. Um, yes, he had this in a section of his website called painted covers. Apparently, he was a painter as well. Yes, yes, he. I believe he did painted covers before he got into comic books, and so that's another thing. You know, a lot of artists they would come from other industries. When you're talking about the 20th century artists, they would come from fashion or magazines or graphic design and then find their way into comic books. Mark was one of those, you know, that Spider-Man and Wolverine comic. That's not the original cover, but that's a very seminal comic book. That's the comic book that would forever define the relationship between Peter Parker and Logan. And again, Owsley and Bright. And um, there's an amazing writer in comics that I'm gonna shout out. I hope I'm not embarrassing him. Um, his name is Christopher Cantwell. And he did a really nice admiration of a two or three page scene in Spider-Man and Wolverine. So if you can find that, find that. But again, it spoke to Mark's capacity to tell a story. Cantwell talks about Spider-Man doing eye acting where how you portray the eyes on his mask tells you Spider-Man's emotional state, whether they're thin or wide open or wide this way or normal mark did that my guy spider-man's wearing a mask and he showed emotional range just by his eyes i have a funny feeling that if we did trivia me and you versus joe we'd lose oh yeah absolutely yeah i think they're, they're, <laughs> <Not even. laughs> that's entirely possible they're, they're, hold on let's see somebody just chimed in mike you want to read this one uh, I had no idea before last week about his painted cover. I just learned that with the Shockwave Transformers cover. So know. probably yes. he was doing work up until Transfer Transformers as well. He was working up to the end, uh, Joe? Well, Transformers was um, the very early Transformers comic book series that Marvel did. Um, it turns out that priest as Owsley was the editor and he hired Mark to do this cover, which is a seminal cover, which has um, the Decepticon shockwave and he's in front of this wall and you have the Transformers logo at the top and on the wall, it says are all dead. And mm -hmm. when priest tells a story, he said um, Hasbro didn't want to do that cover because they thought it would scare kids and his kids would think, oh my God, all the Transformers are dead. I'm not going to buy Transformers 5 and I'm not going to buy Transformers 6. Meanwhile, Transformers is obviously now a reinvigorated and beloved franchise. And that cover is iconic. Yeah, makes you want to buy the comic. Yeah. I yeah, mean, exactly. Uh, exactly. Joe is a living archive. I don't know how many exclamation <laughs> points that is, but uh, however many it is, they mean that you are a living archive. And then this, uh, that was the best. They're very kind. This series as well. So apparently it uh, didn't scare kids. It got the, it scared the money out of their pockets. Yeah. You want to read. Yeah, exactly. Like kids are, kids are smarter than a lot of people give them credit for, you know? So, but yeah, Mark worked on a lot of things. I honestly, I remember buying that Nick Fury versus S.H.I.E.L.D. series because that was just such a compelling premise, Nick Fury having to fight the organization but that, that he led. But like a painted cover. I mean it, it, I mean, it looks like an illustrated cover. I mean, the tremendous detail that goes into it. And this was at a time then when you didn't have a lot of painters, right? You know, you right. quite as many paint people painting. But let's, let's jump ahead. Uh, another, oh, wow uh sketch to final i mean you know we talk about it uh in this discussion everything is there yep. everything is there even as you as you noted you know the light source is hinted at 
the action is hinted at. You see this come in on your desk as an editor, you know that this issue is going to sell well, right, Joe? Not only that, what's really important about this cover on a deeper level is that Black Panther is higher on the cover than Captain America because it's Black Panther's comic book, right? Oh, so of course he nice. should be higher. And you know, back in the day with the vertical racking of covers on spinner racks, it's all about the top third, right? So if you only saw the top third of this, you would see the logo, you would see that corner box, and you'd probably see Black Panther up to his clavicle. Mike, what's right? a clavicle? Mike, what's a, is a clavicle. clavicle? Clavicle. Yeah. Clavicle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Aside, though, Joe, I mean, he, he knew that this was going to get covered, but he still put the work in. 100 percent 100 percent work and hold on we got a good comment that just came in i want to i want to pull this uh mike you want to read this one for us uh let's see dark rain studio i did the layout for the milestone nine card trading set for icon and Dwayne mcduffie paid me 400 dollars. i never realized it was mark bright who did the finishing pencils and inks hey look at that how about that and then he adds i just found his iron man sketch from 1989 uh, I'll give you my mailing address. Why don't you just send that to <laughs> yeah. me right now? <laughs> I, think, I think we'll all give that person a, a mailing address. All right. So whoever it is uh, that is it, that is uh, doing this, obviously a comic pro, tell us who you are because we're not sure exactly who it is. So make sure you uh, give us a little info. Uh, you were waxing rhapsodic about Icon and also about his ability to control light sourcing. You want to you want to give us a quick overview? Because I got a couple of icon covers in here for you, Joe. Well, I mean, with this one, it's, you know, pretty obvious where the light source is. The light source is at the top left, right in the sky, because you see the shadows on that part of the bridge, on the brick wall, on the shadows. Yep. Jamal from DC Comics. There you go. Jamal so worked. Yeah, Jamal worked at DC and he was definitely, you know, an ally to all of us at Milestone in those early 90s from 93 to 97. Joe, what's and, amazing to me, wait, just what's amazing to me is how many pros came out and true enthusiasts came out. Um, Joe, I said, Joe, tweet this out to your to your fans that you're coming. Joe's single tweet got us more retweets than any other any other guest has ever gotten us. And we, we have just more random pros who are coming out of the woodwork to see Joe speak. Well, you know what? You're very kind, but to me, it's 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 about the doctor. You know, it's about it's about Mark. Cause, you know, another thing about him is um, I don't know. I, I remember being um I remember in my early 20s going to comic book conventions and meeting some of the creators behind the comic books that I loved. Um, not all of them were cool. <laughs> some, of, some, some of them were obnoxious, like really obnoxious. Yeah. And I just, I just didn't get it, right? Um, Mark was not that. Mark, at, from my experience, was very humble. He was very chill. I never saw him angry. I imagine he did get angry. And I imagine people like Larry Hama and Christopher Priest um, could speak more to that authoritatively. I never saw Mark angry. Um, and he was humble. Um, you know, greatness does not recognize itself. Hmm. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't. No. Just like Mark Gruenwald, you know, part of the tragedy of Mark Gruenwald was he didn't know if he had made an impact. And I'm like... The Marvel Cinematic Universe is, is embedded with people like Mark Grunwald and Mark Bright. Embedded, right? We're going to get an Armor Wars. Either it's going to be a streaming show or it's going to be a film. Mark drew the first Armor Wars storyline. All right. Okay? Uh, real quick, we got we got a comment here. That was Jamal, 1988. That was Jamal. I, oh, no, wait. So Jamal, you came on board in 1991, and then he was thinking of Jamal Eigel and fellow classmate of art design and SVA, different Jamal. No, I'm, I am talking about, I know Jamal Tate. So when I mentioned him, he was an employee of DC and he was a major, you know, he, he talked with all of us, the Milestone employees. So I remember Jamal Tate, who's different no, 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 from Jamal Eigel. You don't realize our, our audience is, is talking amongst themselves, Joe. 
Oh, got you, got you. Okay, They're okay. Amongst themselves. I, I, I threw oh, you off. yeah. All right, got so let's you, keep got going you. on because this is a showcase of uh, of 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 MD Bright, another uh, amazing color. I have to call out the colorist on this because I do think that the colorist uh, chose some great colors to really make this pop. But of course, you know, uh, MD Bright gave a lot to work with, and all that negative space and all that that black 100 percent yeah to work with you know and make, just the the positioning on the page the way your eye travels and you can see the 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 arc of the of the character and that brings your eye up here and it makes you go all right what's happening i want to read this i think the colorist for this was jason scott jones the guy i told you stuck up for me and so i got accepted into the milestone internship program in time he became the color editor from Milestone, and I believe he colored this cover. Hmm. Well, it's a beautiful yeah. piece of work, and let's see what else we got. Um, this one, a little surprise, uh, unexpected. Uh, so for all of you talking amongst yourselves, uh, tell them what we got here, uh, Joe. So, you know, Milestone and DC Comics did a crossover called Worlds Collide, in which the Superman... Um, office crossed over with the entire Milestone Dakota verse. And so there were DC comics that all the characters appeared in. And there were Milestone comics that all the characters appeared in. So in Icon 16, which was Icon versus Superman, the image on the right is the one that was published. That was not the first one that Mark did. The first one that Mark did is on the left. And at the time, I was not privy to the editorial conversations. I wasn't part of the editorial um, department yet. But if I can put my Dwayne McDuffie cap on for a minute, I would say the problem with this is that Superman is larger than Icon, and it makes Icon marginalized on the cover of his own comic book. Huh. And so the version that we got has Superman and Icon equal status, equal size on the cover. Superman was given the respect of being on the left, but still... These two people, psychologically, they look like equals. Whereas in the first one, psychologically, Superman looks more powerful. Mm -hmm. And so Mark kindly gave me that cover. So I still have the original art and wow. I wanted to share it with, um, you know, people because, you know, it should, it should be shared. You know, it's part, part of the fun of the industry is seeing the behind the scenes drafts but it was a totally finished cover and one of the things that mark was amazing at and um, my friend andrew dowhouse who is a ubiquitous colorist in the comic book industry across all the top companies he said mark bright did capes like nobody he did the <laughs> best capes ever yeah, the best really capes ever he he gave them a life all their own. Um, now, you know, I think, you know, I, I'm going to put Bernie Wrightson in there. And then later on, of course, Todd McFarlane would go bananas. But even Todd McFarlane's chiseled capes, there's this seminal Batman cover he did, which has a chiseled cape, is very reminiscent of how Mark did the chiseled cape. The capes that look like, you know, they were, they were sprayed and, and starched and ironed. They look so crisp and perfect and so unreasonably large but amazing yeah but so here's here's an interesting thing I, I i'm noticing number one look at how far down they pushed the logo how he still had to make this work even though i would say that superman logo is almost 50 percent down on the page so it's really squeezed the art and yet it still works uh yep. i never noticed before the superior uh what, what did you say the the superior positioning exactly because he's on the left and because he's bigger and because he's closer to camera psychologically he's more powerful and it's icons comic book so again compare this to the black panther cover that we saw earlier with captain america guest starring but mm -hmm. black panther is the one at the top mm -hmm. right That's fascinating. because did you ever know that i never knew that yeah yeah, what these things are all psychological. Imagery is psychological. Positioning, coloring, light, shadow. It's part of it's part of the the genius of comic books. It's part of the power of artists. Artists have 
artists have such amazing power and I don't think people understand how much labor it goes, it involves to do a comic book month after month after month. That's labor. I am just noticing something. If you look at the Superman, it's almost an exact mirror image of what he did in the final with Icon. So he was so versatile. Yeah. He was so versatile that he drew it one way. And then he was like, you know what? I still like that pose. I'm going to draw it the other way. Right. That's he how flopped it. <laughs> right? we, we would flop it today in Photoshop and we would call it a flop, right? We, but he literally yeah. redrew. That's how, that's how skilled he was at anatomy that he literally made this image, this image, almost the exact same pose. Because it is a great pose with the knee up, the, the, the fist out, and the silhouette is perfect. Um this is a great cover. And, and you look at those body. two heroes, they have two different um, body structures. Icon has thicker arms. He has broader shoulders. So even when Mark did the flop, he wasn't lazy about it. He said, I have to give this Icon's form. Right? Now, I, I got to tell you, I remember I remember at the time, what was the one that I, what was the one that I liked? The, uh, uh, it was the series... Not Static Shock. Blood Syndicate? Blood Syndicate. Yes. Yes. Wasn't there a Mark, comeback of Milestone a couple of years ago? That, that well, in 2021, Milestone did a comeback. Yes, they did a relaunch and relaunched um, the main titles. Icon as Icon and Rocket, Static, Blood Syndicate, Hardware. So... They basically did the 21st century version of those core characters. And so, yeah, it's great to see the characters make the century jump and engage a new audience and re-engage the existing fans. But again, the, the archetypal versions of these characters, as we understand them, is because of the artist who did so much work that it embedded a look psychologically into our minds. So when we think icon, no matter who draws icon, Dougie Braithwaite, um, even Dennis Cowan, who designed icon, I believe, um, Mark Bright's icon, Mark Bright's rocket are the most recognizable versions of those two characters. Well, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna pause for a second because there's a comment here. Mike, it's a two-part comment. I'm going to take a drink of water. Can you read them read them out for me? Because I think what this person just said in the in the chat, Joe, has a similar parallel impact that it had on your life. Go, Mike. Uh, when I was 16, I walked into a local comic shop, depressed, thinking that black comic artists didn't exist. The shop owner owner told me of Mark Bright, who is a favorite comic artist. I never knew the comic shop owner lifted my heart that day and changed my life forever. How about yeah. that, huh, Joe? Not not too dissimilar from your experience. One hundred percent. You know, there was there was a real life changing moment for me when I walked into the offices of Milestone for the first day for that interview. <laughs> it was full of people of color, and the four founders who each had their offices were black men, but. You know, there was a time early on, I think as a teenager, that I didn't know that Dennis Cowan was black. I don't think I knew Dennis Cowan was black until I saw the Doer's ad that he did of Doer Scotch. And then I was like, holy Toledo, because we're talking about pre-Wizard. The 80s is pre-Wizard. He's got what anybody looked like except for Stan and Jack, right? Yeah. That's pretty much it. And whoever was caricatured in the Marvel bullpen pages or whomever was mainstream enough that you might see a photo of them someplace else, like a Jeanette Kahn, who was a president and publisher of DC Comics. But yeah, the 90s and Milestone and the Wizard Magazine, to your point, that was part of us learning how many of these people were black, right? So and then I'm that do. just Here's something I'm going to put you on the spot right now, Joe Elledge. Go. Will you come back and bring back some other people 
who were present during the milestone era so that we can do some sort of milestone retrospective and understanding of what it was all about. Yes or no, right now, Joe. I'll take a shot at it. <laughs> I will take I will take a shot at it because that's cord that's coordination, but I'll take a shot at it because you know, milestone is something that is indelible in comics. Hold on, Joe's cheering's not a loop. <laughs> There's so much cheering, so much. So much. Cheering. Oh, what is, so that's we're funny. almost out of time. So you're gonna you're gonna try to come back and bring back some people who can help contextualize what milestone meant, and um, and it look there's still a few more comments, Joe, and we got we're gonna have to go in a minute, but a couple quick comments. Uh, I wish they had gotten Mark for the Icon versus Hardware series. Joe, thoughts? Um. I'm not qualified to comment on that, and this is not the place to comment on that. All right, then. How about this one? Hey, Blackstar, thanks for texting me the link to this video. Apparently, Blackstar <laughs> spread the word. Thanks, and then Blackstar. for the uh, – for here, here you go, Joe. For, for the milestone uh, retrospect, Lisa asks, please say yes. And then hold on one thing. In many ways, because of Mark Bright, I moved to NYC, and Milestone became my first internship – that internship mm. helped me become the professor I am today. I don't know. That deserves. All right. So, Joe, thank and you. And that's so Stacey much. Robinson, by the way. Stacey Robinson is a real seminal figure in um, Afrofuturism and the fusion of comic book art education and... Um, the whole art world, the fine art world. Well, I am grateful that you brought um, so much uh, history. I was, uh, I learned a lot tonight, Mike, not just yeah. about art, about character layout and design. There is one more thing, Joe, and I thought this was interesting. I was looking for photos of uh, MD Bright. I said, do you have any candids, anything like that, that, oh, so he said, Valentine. Delandro, thanks, Joe. Yes, thank you, Joe. Um, yeah, and so Valentine's like, an amazing artist in comics. Did um Kelly Sue DeConnick's Bitch Planet, among many other things. Wow. All right, here we go. So this was interesting, and I want to just show this because MD Bright had put this on his his own personal website. Uh, apparently, uh, a musician uh, who would play in church. So he has videos of himself playing. Did you know that your friend uh, was also a musician, Joe? I would find that out later um, and that he re he, he reengaged his um, faith with God. And our last correspondence was a year and a half ago via email. But I did know that. And, and it really warms my heart because when you're in comics, especially now, People wonder, could I do something outside of comics? What would I do if I didn't have comics? But he had music. He had another form of art, you know, and he found his way back to it. So I think it's, it's amazing. I think it's great. And uh, I echo this uh, great interview, Joe. Thanks so much. Uh, you are an excellent guest. Um, we are just about out of time here, Joe. Uh, before we let you go, um, where can we find you? What are you working on and what's coming next this way? People who uh, appreciate what you've shared tonight know where they can find your work. All right. Well, first off, thank you both again for this opportunity to celebrate Mark's life. Um, I can be found on Facebook as Joe Illage, Twitter and Blue Sky as Joseph P. Illage, LinkedIn, Joseph Philip Illage. Um, Instagram illmaster1 and josephillage.com. And if you look at some of those socials, you'll see the kind of history lesson of, of posts that I did, which still does not totally encapsulate Mark's career because we didn't even get into the fact that he illustrated, I think, Snake Eyes origin in G.I. Joe. But mm. that's another story. There is another time interview. for more stories. Uh, and the reason there's time for more stories is because, we, oh, wait, hold on. This is a longer one. Thank you all for celebrating his pastor accomplishments and talking about him. He was a great man. It was a pleasure to meet him. He was such an inspiration to me as a young artist at the time. I, I have never seen quite this many comments uh, for any interview. Did we, Mike? Yeah, I mean, no, this is it. This is the big one. Of, 
And and then by the way, guys, he loved drawing GI Joe. It was his favorite book to draw. So he did he did amazing work on Snake Eyes and Scarlet. And you know, if we could say one thing before we leave here, it's that um I would say two things. Number one, unfortunately, I never took the time to tell Mark that he drew the comic book that changed my life. And I regret that profoundly. So if there's someone out there that did that for you and they're still alive, let them know that they did that. And secondly, let's appreciate the artists who have the skill and not just the artists who have the skill who are the most publicized. Let's really just remember all the people in between who do it for the love and are not necessarily getting wealthy, but um, who are a gift for us. Ah, I love that. And hold on, let me get to the to the clapping. Let's... <laughs> that was a good way. To... And Joe, we're going to put you in the green room uh, where Mike has provided snacks. As I've noted, uh, when you're in the green room, don't do anything awkward because sometimes we do pull you back in for a last minute question. Uh, Mike, what, what is waiting in the green room right now for Joe? Uh, tonight there's Fig Newtons and SpaghettiOs. Oh, wow. <laughs> All right. All right. I mean, that's that's the dinner of champions because okay? it's carbs and carbs. That's it's all you need. Carbs. So Lisa said, amen. And very well said. I agree. Very well said. Joe, hang out in the green room. We'll, we, we won't we won't leave you back there too long. OK, thanks. Thanks again for joining us tonight. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for all having right. us. You know what I love about this show, Mike? What do you love about this show? Buddy? I love that no matter how smart. I am. And I would say that I tend to think pretty highly of myself. <laughs> I have an uncanny ability to bring it back to myself. Uh, I still learn something in every show. I mean, yes. it, it either be it history, uh, page layout, uh, the way artists will sometimes have to draw something and then just draw it again. Yeah. The generosity, uh, but more than anything, sort of like that seminal moment where you something clicks and you say, this is what I want to do with my career. Yes, this is the, there was a here's a good story with that that moment that changed my life. That's like that's the key that sent him down the path where he is now. Yeah, that's and, awesome. and 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 to, for the, for that that moment where this person changed his life, and then he got to work with that person. Yeah. That's incredible, and I yep. think the stories behind that. By the way, uh, Joe, I have to tell you, you're a good, you're a really good storyteller yourself. Well, thank you very much. And I'll, can I leave you with one more little secret yeah, to tell yeah. you about who Mark was? Yeah. So Mark was so generous that while I was at Milestone, and again, remember, I'm working at Milestone, I'm this young guy. I came up with this pitch for a DC comic book that had Our Man, Sun, and like the new Dr. Midnight, who was black because I was a big fan of Christ on Infinite Earths. And I said, hey, let's work up a pitch and pitch it to DC. Do you know he did character designs for all the characters and we pitched it? It never got passed and probably wisely because I probably didn't have the writing chops at the time. But I want you to think about this. This guy took his time to do the character art for this pitch that a young guy wrote and he took it to DC Comics. Wow. That's generosity, yeah. right? So I, I don't know if we got that in about this man, but this man was a generous human being. That is generous, huh? Yeah. I great. don't have that putting Joe back into the green room, but Joe, you got to go back to the green room now. <laughs> nah, that's fine. There's SpaghettiOs there waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> so you got a wow out of that story. All right. Yeah, there's a lot of wow. And I think, you know, What's great about this show is we do this every every Tuesday. I know. Wow, right? A lot of wows out of there. We do this show every Tuesday. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Uh, be sure to do the like, comment, and subscribe. And uh, we promise we will do some sort of follow-up. We're not sure how, uh, but I think, Mike, I think uh, there is some really interesting comic book history uh, that needs to be told. Yeah, i definitely like to, to delve more into this whole thing. Well, when you say it with that much enthusiasm, I really believe you. Well, as you should. Give, give me a little more enthusiasm. I don't have any more enthusiasm, but that was it. That was the peak. That was it. All right. So good night, everybody. <laughs> good night, Dad. Thanks for watching the show. And uh, we'll, 
We'll we'll see you guys again next Tuesday. Good night, everybody. <laughs>